Tell me first about your observations on what's going on in Syria right now. Do you think that military action is justified? Well, Ian, I, th I think uh, what we've seen in Syria is another use of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Um, and uh, it's too late to affect the outcome of the Syrian civil war, but it is important that the Western world re-establishes the taboo against using chemical weapons. That was established after the First World War and the ghastliness is in the, in the trenches. Um, uh, the 1925 Geneva Protocol outlawed it. There was then a chemical weapons convention which basically required the dismantling of all chemical weapons stocks um, uh, back in 1997. So uh, I think it is important that sort of taboo against chemical weapons has got a bit frayed in recent years and we need to re-establish it. And I think this is, is important that there is a reaction to it. And is it important in your eyes that that reaction has to come not just from the United States but from the likes of France, the UK? I, I think this is a common Western approach. Uh, I think when we deal with uh, breaches of international norms, it's right that there should be Western solidarity. We saw that um, in the wake of the, uh, 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 the attack on, on Skripal in Salisbury, where we had very widespread uh, international uh, solidarity with the British measures and I think there needs to be solidarity amongst Western countries and how we deal with the chemical weapons use. And if you were Theresa May or advising Theresa May, how important is it in your eyes that she has to get parliamentary approval before taking any action? Well, I'm a security advisor, I'm not a, a parliamentarian, but I think actually David Cameron made a mistake back in 2013 referring this to Parliament. Parliament is there to uh, debate and, and decide on legislation and to hold the government to account. It's not there to take executive decisions of government. This is an executive decision of government and rests with the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. Do you think people like Vladimir Putin, President Assad, are the kind of people that have to be shown physical force to, uh, to respond? Is that the only way of getting them to talk or change their behaviour? Well, I, I think with the likes of Assad, yes, that, is, uh, that probably is the only way to get uh, uh, Assad to change his behaviour, is he has to pay a price for his use of chemical weapons. I, I think with the Russians it's more complex than that. I think with the Russians we have to be um, very clear about what our intentions are, what is unacceptable in terms of Russian behaviour, and to have the investment in our own defence, both, both military defence and security defence, cyber defence, to, to deal with uh, uh, Russian um, threats to us and hostile actions by Russia. But we also need very clear lines of communication with the Russians to reduce and remove the, the uh, chances of misunderstandings. And uh, 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 we had that during the Cold War. It slipped, frankly, over the last decade or so. And we need to re-establish that uh, we're not going to agree with the Russians, but they do need to know very clearly what it is that we uh, 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 stand for and what we're going to do uh, so that that risk of miscalculation is removed. Why have those diplomatic channels with Russia broken down? I think it goes back to the, um, uh, uh, the period uh, uh, really after the war in Georgia uh, in 2008 and when uh, uh, Putin moved from being president to prime minister. And we rather lost that reality that actually Putin was still the most important man in Russia, still the decision taker. And uh, I don't think President Obama did us any favours by treating Putin with a degree of disrespect and almost contempt. Uh, uh, it's, with, with someone like uh, President Putin, you need to build him up and deal with him as an equal rather than to, to, to push him down. Uh, so I, I think this is a problem which has going, been going back almost 10 years now and we have to rebuild a capacity to, to talk very directly to Putin and to his people um, and to uh, uh, manage between us the very serious differences of opinion that we have with Russia. But how do we in the UK do that in the wake of the Skripal poisoning? Well, uh, I think uh, actually Theresa May has done pretty well so far in managing the, uh, the fallout from that. Um, uh, and it's about uh, showing a lead, being very firm in response to the Russians and working closely with our natural partners in, in Europe, in America, in NATO and across the world. How much damage do you think has been done to the, the protocols of the way the intelligence world worked in the way that Skripal was? apparently singled out and attacked. Well, we, d we don't know the exact details of what happened inside the Russia system. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, he was uh, convicted in Russia back in 2004, I think it was. Um, uh, 
he was exchanged in 2010 during my time as chief of MI6 um, after being pardoned by the Russian system. He wasn't hiding at all in the UK. He stayed in contact with his family in Russia. So it was, uh, I think it's the first time any of us can recall that a, uh, a, someone involved in that sort of spy swap was subsequently targeted in, a, in a, uh, an attempt to kill them. So yes, that, that changes some of the rules. Equally, the use of chemical weapons is an even bigger change to the rules of the game. The use of chemical weapons in a civilian environment, in a, 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 in a NATO country, uh, uh, there needs to be a very clear response to that. And a proportionate response? Of course. Now you make your money these days, you make a living these days from advising businesses on global trends, yeah. global geopolitical trends, macroeconomic trends. Mm. The trade war, the risk of one, is clearly at the centre of that mm. right now. How do you see relations between the US and China panning out? Well, I think uh, this is a serious challenge. Um, uh, President Trump, I think, is right to, to call out the, the Chinese for uh, some of their trade practices, especially the theft of intellectual property. Um, and it's, uh, it's Trump's style, we've come to understand this now. He kicks up a lot of dust, a, a bit of a furor, uh, uh, and tries to put the other side on the back foot and then starts negotiating with them. It's quite hard to do that with China, but he's, um, he's made a start. Uh, uh, all these threats of uh, $50 billion worth of uh, goods subject to new tariffs and kind of retaliation by America, maybe another by China, maybe another $100 billion of, uh, of goods uh, um, uh, in involved. Um, nothing's actually happened yet. Uh, none of these tariffs have yet been introduced. So there is a period for negotiation and for calmer heads to, uh, to prevail. But there is a problem that these, this trade competition between the United States and China is happening at the same time as sort of strategic uh, challenges over North Korea and to some extent over Taiwan as well. This uh, administration has injected Taiwan into the uh, into the agenda, um, and that's an issue on which uh, President Xi Jinping has got no flexibility at all. So it's quite a complex situation which is boiling up there, and that will have impact for, for, for major Western companies operating in China. And not just China, presumably South Korea, Japan, of course, East across, Asia, entirely. across the region, yeah. So where does it go from here? What are the next steps, do you think? I mean, is it incumbent on Xi Jinping now to respond? cooperatively, productively? Well, I, I, I think the, the Chinese are willing to engage in a negotiation with the Americans on this. Uh, and I think the speech that uh, President Xi gave the other day indicated a bit of flexibility in here. The Chinese think that they can, believe that they can deal with President Trump by giving a little bit of ground because the long-term trends are all in their favor. Um, and I think President Trump is also looking for a deal. There are, of course, some ideologues in the U.S. administration and probably some in the Chinese system as well um, who would like a more confrontational approach. I think Trump and Xi will both look for a deal. Um, it's a question of whether they can, uh, as two big egos, two big powerful leaders, they can find space for both of them in the same room. Trump does seem to like doing deals, though. That is very much his approach, isn't it? Which is quite a positive thing in some ways. Exactly, I think that's right. And we're seeing it on uh, another trade issue on NAFTA. Uh, he's, uh, again, kicking up a lot of dust, softening up the parties in Mexico and Canada. And I think he's looking for a deal. You sound to say you quite like him. I don't, <laughs> I think he's a singularly uh, uh, ill-prepared and unsuited person to be president of the United States. But the fact is he was elected by the American people and we're going to have to deal with him. And uh, in this situation, um, uh, you know, some of his instincts aren't misplaced. Uh, he's right about China uh, uh, trade practices. He's right that the use of chemical weapons is completely unacceptable. The rather sort of intellectualized approach that President Obama took um, has been uh, you know, led to the wrong answers, frankly. Um, so you know, he's not my choice of president of the United States. He's uh, not someone I welcome, but he is going to be president probably for the next two and a half years, maybe for the next six and a half years. We've got to get used to it. Now, one of the other big geopolitical macro themes right now is, of course, the advance of technology. Yeah automation. How nervous should ordinary members of the public be about their job security? I, well, there's no doubt that uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the use of uh, data analytics is going to put 
more emphasis on technology and less on, uh, on people. Not only unskilled people, but, but skilled people as well, like lawyers and accountants and doctors. A lot of their work in the future is going to be done by, by machines and done more effectively than people can do them. At the end of the day, it's going to be a combination of, 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 of people and machines uh, which will produce the, most, uh, 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 the, the best, uh, the optimum out, outcomes. I think for, for, uh, uh, for corporates, uh, corporations, the, the issue is how to um, invest in and use new technology as it comes on stream. And also as important, if not more so, how do you attract and retain the talented people needed to master and, and use this, uh, this new technology? I think the people dimension is an understated part of the technology challenge. We know the technology is coming. We know technological change is, is, if, is, if anything, still accelerating. It's getting the talented people from all across the world uh, into the right positions where they can uh, 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 where they can really show their talents inside a inside a uh, major companies. There's obviously a lot of growing awareness of data privacy. We've seen yeah. Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook up mm. on Capitol Hill this week. Mm. How did he acquit himself? Well, I, I didn't watch every hour of his uh, his testimony, but I think um, he uh, came under a good deal of pressure. Uh, he spent a lot of time in recent months apologising for Facebook's uh, uh, poor practices in the past. Um, I think we are getting to a stage where the um, uh, control of data is shifting more to the consumer. We're seeing the um, uh, uh, GDPR, the, gen the uh, General Data Protection Regulation, coming into force uh, this month, I think it is. Um, and that uh, highlights that in Europe, data is going to be the responsibility of the consumer, the individual. In America, it's still the responsibility of the corporate. In China, it's the responsibility of the state or under the control of the state. I think the European approach is probably the best. And, and the way in which the GDPR has global reach, I think will have an impact on other jurisdictions, especially uh, democratic Western-leaning ones. So um, uh, I think this is an area where the EU is, a, is ahead of the game and is setting global standards. So do you think in time the US might introduce GDPR-style regulation of tech companies over there? Well, I, I think at the moment the tech uh, companies have a very dominant position uh, and actually under this administration in particular, uh, there's not much will to change that because the tech companies are too important to American political parties. But over time, the American tech companies are going to have to adjust to GDPR and it will have, an, uh, have a, an impact in America as well because it's about the protection of the data of European residents across the entire world, which means operating in the US as well. Do you think in time their financial returns will also have to be regulated? I mean, Zuckerberg denied that they're a monopoly the other day, but they yeah. do exhibit utility-like yeah. characteristics. Well, we had the CEOs of two major banks uh, 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 on the stage here at the Wall Street Journal conference um, uh, just before lunch, uh, and each of those banks paid more in tax in the last 12 months around the world than Facebook or Apple or Amazon or, uh, or, or Netflix have ever paid in their entire existence. Uh, and the comment from the stage was that the global taxation system has to change to, uh, to reflect the new realities. And again, I think uh, the European Union is likely to be the lead on this. This is something that has to be done on a global basis, so it's not for individual jurisdictions to act unilaterally. But someone's going to have to take the lead. And it looks as though it's going to be Europe. A Europe, of course, in which the UK is no longer going to be part of uh, a year or so from now. You've been very clear you think Brexit's a mistake, mm. but assuming it happens, how does the UK position itself globally to remain relevant and indeed competitive? Yeah, I, I, I do think it's a mistake. I think we've already seen uh, that uh, as a consequence of Brexit, uh, the pound is devalued, uh, our growth rate has gone from the, the strongest in the G7 countries to the weakest in the G7 countries. That's just inside two years. Um, but I, <coughs> I do think we're going to have to get accustomed to it. Uh, I think we need to minimise the damage of Brexit as far as we can, but then also strengthen our financial services industries, our technology industries, so that, um, uh, that despite Brexit, we can still grow and prosper as a, company, uh, as a, as a country. Uh, uh, and I think we've got some talents that will enable us to do that. I, I was talking to a senior minister last night who was saying that um, uh, 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 this was someone who supported the Remain side of the, uh, of the equation, but that 
one of the impacts of, um, uh, of Brexit will at least be that we've dealt with the extreme right in British politics. Uh, that They will somehow be neutered by this Brexit process. It's quite a price to pay for doing that, but we won't have the, the recurrent challenge of uh, extreme right factions impacting on British politics. We've still got a hard left faction we have to deal with as well, um, but if, if we can get as a result of Brexit, if we can get politics in Britain back to a, a consensus around the centre, around national interests, um, and build a strong economy again, then who knows, in, in five, ten years' time, we could be back on our feet uh, and, and uh, uh, have respect around the world. And you've written and spoken a lot about the importance of Britain having a voice globally, mm. about the long period of decline, really, that the UK's had since the end of the First World mm. War. Mm. How important is it, though, that Britain is a player on the world stage? I mean, we're a sort of middle-ranking nation, aren't we? Well, we, we, we still have uh, uh, an important strength in the world, and we have a lot of respect around the world uh, as well, um, uh, and a lot of natural advantages as a, 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 as a country. Uh, it's a dangerous and difficult world. We can shy away from those dangers. We can sort of uh, uh, bury our heads under the pillow and, and just focus on life inside Britain. But the reality is if you don't confront a challenge, whether it's the cyber threat or whether it's the use of growing use of chemical weapons, then that threat gets closer and closer to you. I'd much rather have a world in which countries like Britain shape the global environment than one in which it's shaped by others like China or Russia or Iran. Uh, and we sort of hide ourselves away for a generation or so and leave it to our children or our children's children to pick up the pieces.